All right, here, here, here. Greetings, brothers and sisters. This is Yadin right here, LOJ Society, the Lion of Judah Society. Here, here, here. All right, so what we're going to seek to address and call this one here is the fallacy, like the lie, you know, or the pseudo pseudoscience, right? But the lie or the fallacy of fourth century Ethiopic or Gutter's origins. There's this popular fallacy or academic, it's an academic um, fallacy. This means that it's not true, but it has been repeated as I think was it Joseph Goebbels, Goebbels or somebody like that. Um, the propaganda minister for the Nazi party says something. I've heard people say this before, but y'all can correct me if, if I'm incorrect or inaccurate with this. But the basic principle remains true that like a, a lie that's repeated, often repeated. And you have these academic lies that a lot of the pseudo, the pseudo black scholars and pseudo master teachers out there. Right, and we're directing this at the so-called ones they call them the dagger, dagger squad out there. We just caught a little clip. It's called uh, Dr. Richard Carrier versus Pastor Damon Richardson slash my book. This is Garfield, right? Not the cat Garfield, right? But Garfield, right? My book comes out June 18th, right? So, Isha Shelley. Um, me stay. I and I wife, she was listening to it when I had come forward, I got to hear it and then she rewound it and I was listening to a good, uh, what was it, maybe 15, 20, almost a half an hour or so, right? We caught a little bit of it. It was a Eritrean, a Eritrean brother, I'll say Eritrean brother, right? Not Ethiopian in that sense, but let's just recognize what it is today and the reality today. And Eritrean brother, who was basically came on to build. He he wanted to build, and he he was very happy. It seemed like to be on the air with ones like you know Garfield and the Dagger Squad. I think it was the Amin Ra, you know, atheists, you know, that were there too. So they were like, he came on. He was speaking certain things about the language where he was from, so forth and so on. And before he could really even just make his particular point, they started to they started to attack him. They basically started to attack him, right? Because they were like, "Oh, you're coming with this uh, this fake ass Ethiopian stuff. It is fake ass Ethiopian shit." And he said, "No, no, 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 no not, I'm not not Ethiopian." He said, "Maybe you didn't hear me from the beginning." <laughs> um, Eritrean, and he was speaking about the Kalagas, you know, and the Gas and the Ethiopic and you know, and the history and the people and, and who he is, right? And he would use the terminology about like, you know, how like on your block, people can't tell you what goes on on the block, you know, or in the hood, unless they really from the hood and they like in the hood or tell you about what's going on on them streets and they're not really from them streets. You know, the first thing we would say or ones would say is that they don't have, you know, they don't have no right and they don't have no standing, using a legal term. They don't have no standing in that. And then to hear these ones like Garfield and the rest of them, right, that barely can really bring forth English and understand English words, basic English words, much less uh, academic terminology and what is being said in a lot of the academic journals and other things that they peruse, you know, for attack points against, and get this right here, against those who believe in the Bible or use the Bible as a historical, um, scriptural, biblical, religious even. And, but the religious part is not even what's being discussed, just the basic viability, right, of the Bible. And see, here's where a lot of their pseudo-scholarship, I'm going to get to the point about the fallacy right here, but just to kind of touch on this, because this is the segue to this, because that became the recurring theme and point. Right, because what they were trying to say was that it's the fourth century that Gutters, right, that there are no older Ethiopian or Eritrean. Ethiopia is like the kind of cover term for the region, right? But there's no documentation in the Gutters. In the Gutters, they say Gies. They like saying Gies. That that right there shows that even European scholars, right, though they speak European languages, they try to at least even 
assimilate and say, you know, what the languages that they've been studying and writing about the cultures. You know, you hear European scholars, you know, reading Chinese and speaking Chinese, speaking Arabic, speaking Hebrew, speaking Gutters or referring to these terminology, speaking Amharic, speaking all sort of, speaking Algonquin, Indian, Native American speeches, all kind of speeches. I mean, you don't get to rule nearly three quarters of the world and set up your system if you're going to be ignorant, right, willingly ignorant and knowingly ignorant of people's linguistics. So here's what we say a lot of the so-called black conscious, so-called conscious black scholars are, are pseudo-scholars, right? And we've been saying that before. Um, what's the atheist guy? Um, um, what's his name? <laughs> From the Amen Ra, before he even started to really, they, they really started to run that word and everything so forth and so on. You know, the pseudo, the pseudo. Right. But the Bible talks about uh, science falsely so-called pseudo pseudonomos, right? Pseudonomos. Pseudo means false or fake and nomos name. And now there's a lot of fake history that is being used right, to abuse the seeking black people, black people really seeking what's what. Right? They're getting caught up on ones like Garfield as he's pushing, you know, he's really pushing his new book coming out June 18th. You could check it out at Dagger Squad. It's not that we're promoting his book, but hey, we might even get a copy of it as well to see what he really is saying right here, right? And get ready for income and incoming. But here, let's touch on this whole pseudo. Why do we say it's pseudo? Because first of all, they say that, well, Gutters, Ethiopic, is just a so-called AD thing, right? And they say fourth century. Fourth century in academia, Right, among the academics and the scholarships and in college and on that particular level of study, the, the century that is called is really speaking of like the hundred years before. So when they say the fourth century is to say like the 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 three hundreds, everywhere from three hundred all the way to three nine nine, right? To, to the year three hundred and ninety nine would be fourth century. So when you go into like the you know, some of the research right here, Chant, we just closed this window right here. Let's see if we can open this window again. We just had a window. We had a window on on the, oh, here, here it goes. It's, it's the next window over, right? Just to share this, you, go look this up on Wikipedia. Cause a lot of people say, like they were saying to the brother, I think it was Rob Bond, so and then his cousin, if I'm correct, he, he was saying like, um, can you Google anything that shows what he was saying about Gutters being actually BC and being way older and even seeking to link it with the with the so-called biblical Hebrew or the Masoretic Hebrew before he could even get there, they started to, you know, kind of run him off the road, the Eritrean brother run him off the road of what he was saying and saying, Can you show us you have any proof? Like, can you show us that? He even said, well, he's not in the church, and he talked about the Tawahido, and I don't know if they was thinking about Tawheed, because there's Tawheed among the Muslims, right? Tawheed, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know what I mean? But there's also Tawahido, Tawahido, right? And Tawahido also speaks about oneness, right, in the sense of God and man through Getachin Jesus Christos, which is kind of a theological, both of them are theological concepts, but as soon as he mentioned to why he don't want to, woo, you know, like, but you couldn't tell how they was coming with it, but finally they said, well, can you show us anything, right? Because they're saying that the facts, the facts that they ascribe to, that they have put their belief on, and it's basically belief. So a lot of these guys will go against belief and religion because, you know, they're anti-Bible and they're really the anti-Christ, they're anti-Black Christ, they're anti-Black anti Messiah, though they might not really admit that, but if you see what they are for and what they are against. So they're for, like, the Google research, doing the Google research. Now, Google, as you mentioned before, Google is very, you know, can be useful. It can be a useful tool. Wikipedia can be a useful tool, right? But don't be a fool, right, and deep end on it without really... Um, getting your own standing, right? And your own standing means that, for example, we were studying things like, we was into some Coptic stuff years ago, like maybe a couple of decades ago, right? We went out of our way to really start to learn or become familiar with the Coptic language, right? With the linguistics, 
of it, right? When we were interested in like Islam or Arabic kind of things, we learned Arabic, although Arabic was one of our first, you know, languages and everything, you know, so therefore maybe we're a little more inclined to it, but there are European and white scholars, uh, many of them, Budge and the rest of them, who have gone around the world to research, to dig up stuff themselves, right, or others dig it up for them, Right? And to learn linguistics and the language of these ancient cultures and to attempt to decipher it. And now you have a lot of so-called black scholars or pseudo-black scholars right, that will regurgitate their regurgitation. Right? You know what I mean? We'll regurgitate. We'll try to feed you what the other ones, the European scholars threw up, whether it's good or bad or otherwise. And they don't really have the standing. I was thinking that the Eritrean brother could have said to him, My, um, do you know any goods? Do you even know the alphabet? Can you even name one letter? Right? Can you read one word? Like, are you familiarized? I'm sure. I think Rob Bourne, I'm not too sure if he's if he's 5% uh, you know, na Nation of Islam or so forth and so on. But even there, when certain people become... You know, whatever they become, say Muslim or whatever, they begin to learn Arabic, even among the, you know, Muslim or if they're, they're, they're Jew, you know, um, European or not, right? You know, Israelite, Hebrew, you recognize that Hebrew is important. Many of these ones have been pushing like the Amun Ra and the rest of them, ancient Egypt, but most of them don't even know any so-called Metuneta, right? And they find this to be offensive when somebody really hits them with it and say, listen, you're calling yourself a scholar. And even Dr. Ben don't even want to go there. They say, God, but I don't know if he was into God. I don't know what kind of God. He was a Jew, but then he, he you know, black Jew, but he, he fell off, right? He, he made his decision. But he even said, right, that nobody reads the Metuneta, right? And this is their master scholar. So you see all these, these significant fundamental hypocrisies and inconsistencies, right? And for those within the... The generally speaking, you know, potential, I'll say potential black community, because we're ones and ones say that there is nowadays, there really is no black community, maybe a black community online, so to speak, you know, but the real black, I'm not talking about a black neighborhood, right, where we all live in one area because of, you know, um, what they call redlining or any of these kind of um, racist, you know, systemic government policies that have black people living in a certain particular area. Although, if they were given a right to choose like a lot of other peoples, <laughs> you know, they would choose all other areas, right? I would say because the earth is Yahuwah, Jehovah's in the fullness thereof, but, you know, recognizing that you have those who are um, believers in the truth and those who are believers in the lie. So many of the ones like Garfield and the rest of them, you know, pseudo-black scholars and, and, and the pseudo-black scholarship. I say pseudo, especially when they are entering these particular areas and trying to, you know, um, gain some traction with bald tires. They're trying to gain some traction going uphill and their tires are stripped bald, right? They say go to Wikipedia, right? They say go Google it. Don't you know that what's on the Google is basically most of it is hand uploaded installed information i mean i don't know how many of y'all remember wikipedia page like over maybe two decades ago i don't know how long they've been around but i know more than a decade so when he first came out some of the information that was up there and then over time with the you know the kind of what they call it um, crowdsourcing where the you know people will basically check information like like you know somebody writes something on a wikipedia page you know about some area of um history or culture or something and other ones who you know will quote somebody else and they'll put all this information there so what you basically get is all the best information that is available on the internet it doesn't mean all of it is accurate or factual but it probably can be backed up by someone's research and research is a combination of the evidence the facts right and then what you believe or what the consensus you know like they say peer review like peer means your peers your mates you know what your mates say right and if your mates are ones that have a high standard Right, it might make the research even a higher quality, and we would like for so-called black scholarship, 
right, so-called black scholarship and research, especially into these areas, right, to be of a higher quality. And it's a shame that things have fallen down so low until many ones who are so-called pro-black are going to just be wholesale regurgitating, right, information about other black peoples, since they love black people so much, right, but other black peoples, and then when the people say, well, I am from there, I know about my culture and my history and not allowing them and giving them an opportunity, you know what I mean? Opportunity to speak. I mean, to speak and to let that point be there instead of attacking. I mean, they really attacked this brother, but this brother really exposed them. And we had to pause it at a particular point because we paused it actually at the point that we came in where he was speaking about the good is Bible. He was trying to show things and they're trying to shut him down on it while one of their fellows was saying, well, you can't prove to us that good is is older than the fourth century because Wikipedia don't say, Wikipedia say so. Wikipedia. Here's what we have for the Wikipedia. It says the Gutters, right, falsely called or called by others, right, that don't have the opening of the mouth. That's what a lot of these so-called pro-Kemitic, they talk about all this Kemitic, 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 Kemitic stuff, ancient Egypt stuff, but they don't have the opening of the mouth. So maybe when they speak about some things that happen in America around the hood or some like American or Jamaican or, or West Indian, you know, Caribbean, politics and history that we know of over the past 50, 100, 150, 200, maybe up to even 400 years. Maybe you can listen to some of these guys when they're talking about our own history here in America and the Caribbean. But now you're going to listen to these guys because we know it. And we know that the white man, the European or the Anglo-Americans have, not all, not all, not all, but many have lied or prevaricated or misled through that. We talk about the textbooks in America how our history and the history of our ancestors, enslavement, right, in this North country and the Caribbean, how it's been twisted up in modern textbooks or in certain states, or they would edit or they would um, remove or censor certain information, you know, or even prevent certain information to be taught in, like, public schools. I mean, how many times have conscientious black parents and, and black and brown and others have gone to the length of protests and maybe even some civil disobedience, you know, in other words, have to really make a little, a little kind of um, um, a little riot, so to speak, because of their children being um, taught disinformation in the school or some information is not being included in the curriculum. I mean, that's a whole issue. You got ones who who are right now, you know, fighting on those fronts right there. So if they do this with our history over here, we, the black peoples over here, black peoples of the world, but especially in the Americas and the Caribbean, who we say the once lost, now found, black and brown sheep, the people of the Beit Yisrael, the Beit Israel, right? That's who we say, right? Based on our scholarship, based on our research, based on our knowledge, right? And based on our positive evidence and factually back belief right so if they do this with our culture over here as we black people and we have to fight them on certain like like just the most recent incident in the news right where some black person or black people what we take sometime persons at a time you know black man this time black woman this time black child black or brown right or native american if something happens to them right something happens to them and then the news puts out one thing, the police say one thing, and then the eyewitnesses say this, and then others say, well, the newspaper said, oh, you mean it's in writing? Yeah, I was able to Google it. You can Google it and see what really happened. And then somebody's saying that I was actually on the streets when that happened. I saw it. And he said, well, do you take a cell phone? Well, we can't believe you. But, but somebody else was here with me too. These other people, no, we're going to just believe the news. This is what these guys do when they go Google... Um, um, they're like Google fanatics. I mean, like you say, Google is a good tool, right? Even they know it's a good tool because they know that it's basically crowdsourcing information, right? There's some information that got to the internet because ones like myself and others, you know, of the Habarim, you know, of the, of the friends, you know, basically put things out there. And then others got to see these things because we uploaded it. Right? Sometimes we scanned certain things, information that we had in books, that books that wasn't available, and we put it out there. 
right? And now because it's put out there, now this helps to kind of change, you know, the 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 perspective of things because you have to relook over everything else that was being spoken about in that subject matter and say, well, this is other information because people didn't believe that that we had this evidence because they kept saying, well, this is what like Wikipedia is saying. This is what this book, this writer is saying. Well, did you read this other writer or this other researcher? Did you read their book? Where sometimes they took on the disinformation, the other person's book, but that book might have been suppressed or whoever was promoting the other book, the other information, chose not to include the other information. Right? Because they have standards. So we need to have standards as well. Right? So many of these ones and ones, you know, um, don't really have the proper um, standing or the qualification to really challenge ones who are either from those areas, those regions of the world, and many of them may have studied because we have Ethiopic and Eritrean, you know, Ethiopian, Eritrean, other black people, Beta Israel, other scholars who have been doing their scholarship, sometimes looking at the same original material. Sometimes they are recognized by even their so-called white academic peers, the European and other nationality academic peers, right? And yet you will just go with the white scholarship that gets all the, the publication and not to the other scholarship that challenges it. Right? And say that, well, the white scholarship must be correct, the, the certain, certain, because there's other white scholars that even the whole issue about Gutters, Ethiopia, the Kevin and the Guess, and would like to even touch on like, um, like Bernard Lehman, Bernard Lehman, the very good book. Hopefully we'll have the time, you know, on the other broadcast platforms, also the Patreon the Patreon, we got to hear that Rastafari sabbatical, some of the, you know, most of the old videos are going to be re-uploaded and available to download. That's coming along, brothers and sisters. Go to lojs.org, link there, hit the contact. Hopefully, maybe we'll have like a mailing list for ones and ones very soon. Not just there just yet, but let's touch on this, the fallacy of fourth century. First of all, the popular view is that it was in the fourth century Right, that all of this, we could say, biblically related literature first came into Ethiopia, we could say, Eritrea, the Horn of Africa region. This is the popular view. Basically, as they say, that the Ethiopians, the popular view, the fallacy, right, the Gnosis Pseudonymous, science and knowledge falsely so called, is that Ethiopia became Christian, and where they first became like Christian or aware of Christianity or Christian ideas, so to speak, right, in the fourth century. And therefore, they say, well, the Gutters is no older than the 4th century, right? The Gutters language is no older. And they say, well, how is that? Well, they say, well, it's because in the 4th century, there was this Ethiopian king that was worshiping sun, moon, and sky who became Christian, right, to worship our black Lord and Savior. And at that time, they did recognize that Jesus Christos, a historical person, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach, right, was black, as well, right? He became a Christian, right? He said that he became a Christian in the fourth century, and then all of a sudden we're to believe that a language, a language just popped up all of a sudden, a language which is both in its knowledge of archaic words that are used by and were used by biblical translators of the oldest versions of the Hebrew and Masoretic. Get this right here. That the Bibles that we have and the translation that come from like the Old Testament, the Berit Shoshana, you know, Old Testament scripture, what is called the Tanakh, right? That the translators, right, and also the concordance references that are used, Gesenius. Have you heard of Gesenius? Some say Gesenius, but Gesenius' lexicon, right? Gesenius, you heard of Strong's Concordance that if you really do your real research with some of the materials like Blue Letter Bible, especially, they will allow this, like with certain words from Hebrew, they reference the true meaning of these words that are in Strong's Concordance. The background to that for the Old Testament is documents and research works like the Gesenius or Gesenius, J E not J-E-G-E, it's G-E-S-E-N-I-U-S. 
So I, I would say that as Gesenia, some might say it as, as G and the J, all that in English it gets confused, but in the older language, because it seems like it's a coin of Greek, right, Gesenius. But in his lexicon, the point of reference for the archaic meaning of words, right, is Ethiopic. So here, here's what's being said. It's saying that the Ethiopic language and the knowledge among these people of these archaic roots that have been codified even among themselves in dictionaries and reference documents are used by biblical translators of scriptures that's regarded to be older that they use the Ethiopic as points of reference. And, and we have this in other scholastic works, right? Some of them are in German and some of them are in Latin. Right, that we have studied that shows that they use Ethiopic right, as a point of reference. That means that all the research scholarship that might try to say like, like late date, they try to late date gutters, they try to late date it and say because a volume of documentation started to increase in the fourth century, they put forward the lie that it's in the fourth century where this language just became a language as though it never existed. And for the first reason I give, right? The first reason I give is that to translate, say, Masoretic scriptures, Masoretic scrolls. Some people date some of the oldest scrolls going back to, we could say, the just, just rough estimates, say, the 500 BC. You know, we've seen certain research work that talk about how some of the later scrolls, right, bear witness to some of the earlier fragments that they find and Dead Sea Scrolls and other kind of scrolls, manuscripts that are found all around the world. Let me just mind you of that. We think that all the manuscripts are just in Israel or in the Palestine, the land of Canaan, but actually since the biblical and historical narrative explains that the Hebrews, the Israelites were scattered all over the world, this is why we can find all over the world, especially among those communities that identify as Jews, right, or Hebrews or Israelites who are not European, Ashkenazi, Khazarians, but they are Jews, Hebrews, Israelites, Right? All can testify to that. So the late dating of Gutters, right, is a fallacy because they expect us to believe that way. You mean just in the fourth century because one of the Ethiopian kings or emperors, Azana, he became Christian and stopped worshiping the sun moon. See what these guys are concerned, like Amun Ra Squad and the rest of them, Dagger Squad, the Dagger Squad and the rest. What they're concerned about is worshiping sun, moon, and stars. And what they're upset about, right, is that a civilization like Ethiopia, Eritrea, which is so ancient, somehow gave that up for the very thing that they fight against, the Bible. And because from a black perspective, right, or from black peoples, right, over there in what is pseudo, pseudonymously called the Middle East because they can prove it, but the white scholarship does not want to give them the credit for it in the same sense. We say that black people created a whole bunch of things over here in America, right? We did a whole bunch of, you know, good, bad, and ugly, but we only hear about the bad and ugly, but of the good things that we did, right? Creations, inventions, they don't want to talk about it. Right? They don't want to talk about it. So you get somebody today who writes a book about all the black inventions and people will be bumping the book, but then somebody else could come along tomorrow and say, well, that book was written when? That book was written in 2021, 2020, 2022, and they're talking about things, inventions that went back over 400 years. This must be a lie. He, this guy is just making stuff up. Right? That the first recorded black inventions was just when this guy wrote his book. There was no, nothing like that because it's way of dismissing. And then if you're going to go to that point of view and say, well, everything in this guy's book about black inventions, right, over the past 400 years is a lie because he wrote the book in 2021 or 2022, and he's talking about black inventions that go all the way back over 400 years. He's just making this up. There's no evidence. There's no proof of it. And he might say, yes, the proof is, is the Library of Congress catalog. And then they could take the Library of Congress catalog out of there. We know they have suppressed information before because some of this information, most of what we're talking about is like national security things, if you think about it. Right? Because people recognize, man, we were really lied to. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And then other people who are fighting other people, maybe their own people because of these lies, begin to reevaluate everything. It changes the whole world view and thus the end of the world or the end of the world order, the end of the present world system, the nation states. But here is what they say. They say the Goethe's language is classified as a South Semitic language. It evolved, right, this is on the Wikipedia page, from an earlier Proto-Ethio-Semitic ancestor used to write royal inscriptions of the kingdom of, um, they, they have Demet, Demote, right, in epigraphic South Arabian script. Now, the Garfield point that he was trying to bring forward, a part of what it seems as though he was trying to bring forward, is that we know where it comes from, because it comes from these particular people of the Demet or Demot. The brother even corrected him on the Damot, the pronunciation of it, because the way they have it right here is like unvocalized with a vowel system. That's a whole other interesting reason, right? Now, South Arabian. Right, South Arabian. If I were to tell you that the real, the old, the ancient Arabs of the historical biblical scripture of the time were black people, most of you would think that what I'm saying is crazy. But then maybe I have to get one of the the modern day like um, Arab people, like you know the nowadays Arab people, the so called like white, reddish, brown Arab people. I might have to get them to admit it because many of them even admit these kind of things. You know, it's not it's not us alone that have black mothers, right? You know, historically. Right? But the Gutta's language is no longer universally thought of as previously assumed to be an offshoot of Sabian or South Arabian. Now, just this, this, that point right there, not to even go into the deeper study of it, because we're just keeping this basic right here, that the Ethiopic, well, they call it Ethiopic, Gutta's is referred to in academia as Ethiopic, but Gutta's language is no longer universally thought up. Now, think about this for a moment. Universally, that's everywhere in the universe, including the Ethiopians and the Eritreans who use this language and have used this language, thought of it as. So you see how they use words to kind of promote their philosophies. And if we don't check them, what do they mean by universally thought of? You mean universally in the Western white, you know, Gentile world, as previously assumed in the Western white Gentile world, Right, in the world system, Anglo-American, politically speaking, to be an offshoot of Sabian or South Arabian. And there is some linguistic, though not written. Get this right here. They have an open parenthesis says, though not written. There's some linguistic l language, linguistic. That means how we speak, right? Evidence but it's not written of Semitic languages being spoken in Eritrea and Ethiopia since approximately 2000 B.C. 2000 B.C. Do you know what this means? 2000 B.C. 2000 B.C., according to, like, people ask, like, when the Exodus and all this occurred, and we can answer these questions with the evidence, with the facts, biblically, historically, you know, 2000 BC, this will be before the time, this is roughly around the time, this is before the time of Abraham, Abraham, roughly around the time of Abraham, let's say two, uh, 6, 000, 600 years, yeah, 400 years, the Exodus roughly 1440, 1440, roughly around that time, not the late date that they try to give to the Exodus, because Europeans do this scholarship, this, a lot of their scholarship have done this, let me say that, because some of the new scholarship is checking it, but a lot of their old scholarship have done this, right, where they late date certain things, they late date certain things, so they can dismiss those other evidences that would be those peoples who they said were not who they really are. In other words, they will late date certain things. For example, they late date the Exodus, right, in Egypt, right, to throw off the narrative, right, and therefore to say that the Bible is all fake and false because such and such. Really, what's, what's confusing is Egyptian chronology. Egyptian chronology is really what is broken up. And actually the Bible and the scriptures actually have helped those Egyptian and comedic, well, more the Egyptian uh, Egyptology scholars in helping them. You know what I mean? So talking about biting the hand that what? So here they say that the Semitic 
this Semitic language is, there's evidence of it being spoken in Eritrea and Ethiopia since approximately 2000 BC. But then he say, though not written. And that's what everybody's going to zoom in. Oh, it's not written. It's just what people say. Well, Garfield, you're you writing a book probably based on what other people have said, based on whether they have done research or not, but you like what they say. Right now, you wrote a book, and somebody can say, this is what you say, and regardless of these other people that you quote from or you quote their materials, it's still what they say. Right? And see, here's what they're doing. They're trying to say that, well, we're looking at, do you have a written, actual written document? And then they'll say, well, in ancient Egypt, we have documents, right? There's some scrolls that they have going back to roughly, you know, that time. There's some written, of course, there's a lot of monuments and things carved in stone that you can find. And here's the good thing about Ethiopic and South Arabian or Sabian. See, there is a Sabian connection. This is the important thing. And so it's like now they're trying to dismiss this Sabian connection, right? This Sabian connection, right? Because when they say that the good is language is no longer universally thought of as previously assumed to be an offshoot of Sabian. Let me show you why they're trying to say that it's not an offshoot of Sabian. Let's just do this right here because we're going to have to pick up on this a little bit, a little bit more. So let's go over here and let's go right here and let's look up Sabian, right? Let's look up Sabian, right? Um, how is the script right there? Let's see. Say, say, B, and really, it is. Um, how do you spell it? How do you spell it? Sabaean. Sabaean. Right? I think it's Sabaean. The way this particular word is. Right? Let's go Saba right here. Let's go Saba. Right? Sabian. And what we're looking for is. Um, okay, what's the verse that we're looking for? Um. Oh, okay, so to the, was it, was it, was it Greek? No, it was the Grecians. Grecian. Let's look for the Grecian verse. Some of you know what verse I'm, I'm going to right here, right? The Grecian verse, right? So we have Grecia and Daniel, and then we should have Grecia right, right there. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go right here, right? You see the verse? The verse is Yoel. Joel 3 and 6. The children also of Yehuda and the children of Jerusalem have your soul to the Grecians, the Greeks, right? The Gracchoi, the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Let's bring up more, more on this verse, right? All right? So now going on, it says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place where you have sold them. That's what's going on now, right? Amongst those who ascribe to being Hebrews and Israelites, right? And, and Jews or black Jews of the line of the tribe of Judah and therefore even then the Ethiopian or the Sabian, the Sabian connection. I'm just showing you why they're now trying to, to renege on something that they once said and then say, although there is some linguistic evidence not written of Semitic languages. See, they're being very dubious right there. Being spoken in Eritrea and Ethiopia since approximately 2000 BC, right? 2000 BC is at least 600 years, right? At least 600 years before, right? Before the Exodus, right? According to our numbering of the Exodus and other, you know, scholarship and, and the evidence, the evidence and the facts bring it out, right? And the arguments that also back up the evidence and the facts and the perspective that we take. Others might take another perspective. So be it. Right, but you can't deny the evidence and the facts. It says, Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. So what it's basically saying right here in Joel chapter three, verse six and seven, is that the children of Yehuda, of Yehuda, right? There's the tribe of Judah. A remnant of that tribe of Judah made it to the highlands of what we call Ethiopia today or the Horn of Africa. And the children of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Some of the inner Africa tribes, some people try to dismiss it, even the Yoruba and others have this connection with Jerusalem in their own oral histories. But then somebody will dismiss it and say, well, it's not written, and it's just what you keep telling yourself. So, Remember the example I give of, of black people over here in the Americas and the West Indies, the Caribbean, right, as well, Jamaica, for example. 
ones have talked about your ancient history, what Nanny and Cujo and, 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 and these different ones, Paul Bogle, and even before that time, you know, what ones have done, but very little of it was written down. Then you get a scholar today, right? You know, this is what Garfield, the areas of research that ones like him should be doing. Right, instead of dabbling here and there, causing confusion almost everywhere, you know, but if you write this down of your own history, your own people, so forth and so on, right? And then somebody say, well, that never happened. Why you say it never happened? They're saying that your, your family is a bunch of liars, that your ancestors. So I submit this to you. If they tell you about what happened 50 or 100 years before, your own family, your own Jamaican family, your own black American so-called family tell you, don't believe it because they're lying, but if the white man writes a book, right, and then puts the excerpts of it, you know, and the points on Wikipedia, it is correct because on Wikipedia. Wow. All right. Um, is Israel a homeborn slave? All right. However, the good is script. Okay. Before we go on right here, let's right here. Here's the verse. Verse 8. And I will sell your sons and your daughters. So here's what we're reading, and here's what we need reading comprehension. It's saying that the children of Yehuda, right, of Judah, right, we say we the black Jews, and the children of Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, have ye, right, sold to who? Sold to the Grecians, right? So it's speaking about the sale, right, of black peoples, right, to other peoples. And history tells us, this is why we find so much black evidence and relics, right, all up in Greece. Even when Greece was taken over by the Gracoi people, the Ionians, the, the Javanites, the Ionians were taken over by the Gracoi people, by the more, we could say, Fira or Albino people, so-called white peoples. They still had a bunch of black presence there that many scholars today say that Greece was black. For a long time, they even find late date archaeology and artifacts there. Part of the reason is because some of those were Jews or Judahites of the tribe of Judah as well as children of the capital city of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And they were sold to the Grecians. They were sold to the Gracois. Right? You know the modern Arab, a lot of the Arab people are also part, like in Egypt, the Greeks, the Greeks were ruling there. Right? And there was an admixture of peoples. Right? But here it distinguishes that the children of Judah would stand out. Why? Because when you find those black artifacts in ancient Greece, don't they stand out? You say, wait, I thought the Greeks were, were, were white people. And I will sell your son. So those who did this to us, right? The word, the oracle here of Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem, Holy One, blessed be he is, I will sell your sons and your daughters. How? See, this is what's going to happen and it's coming to this time of happening. Thought all of my black Hebrew and Israelite brothers were crazy, right? But look what it says right here. I, and some of y'all thought we, saying we Ethiopian Hebrews were crazy, but look at this right here. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah. So that means that that's like what the word in Ecclesiastes said, the thing that has been is the thing that will be. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah. And they, so the children of Judah, of Yehuda, by right, Yehuda, Right, so-called Negro, right, over here, and the, the royal so-called Negroes over there, speaking about the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, right? And it says, and I will sell you. So those who sold us, their sons and daughters, are going to be sold into the hand of the children of Yehuda, the children of Judah. And they, the children of Judah, of Yehuda, shall sell them to the Sabians. Now you notice this? Look how Sabian is spelled here and then look how Sabian is spelled elsewhere. Elsewhere they spell it S-A-B-A-E-N. Here we have it S-A-B-E-A-N. So you got to pay attention to those details. What some of the pseudo black scholars and master teachers don't do. Right? Then they're offended when somebody else does and checks them on that. And they shall sell them to the Sabians. Wait, wait. So you're saying that if we know that white folks and some people have sold our people then actually the time will happen, maybe like, what, 400 years, right, that nation, right, you know, that nation shall be judged, and I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they, the children of Judah, right, the Bene Yehuda, right, shall sell them to who? The Sabians. The Sabians, there's the Ethiopian, 
the Horn of Africa. There, 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 there's the connection right there. To a people, what? Far off. Rachok. Right? <laughs> right? To people far off. Ruk. Right? People far, for Yahweh, Jehovah, have spoken it. Now we see, if we really are able to see through all of the so-called white noise and everything, the static. Right? So this is the reason why it's Joel chapter 3. Verse 8, this is the reason why right here, what we read from the Wikipedia page as of 520 5 right? Because they change it. We notice, we, we save some of the old pages. We go back to different pages and see how they change up some things. Sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But here, here, here where it says the Gutters language, Gutters, Ethiopic, a.k.a. PKA, right, publicly known as Ethiopic, but Gutters, right, Lasana Gutters is no longer universally thought of as previously assumed to be an offshoot of Sabian or Old South Arabian. Now, one of the re they have a quote right here, and they have somebody named Vinegar, Vinegar Stefan, or Vinegar, Vinegar Stefan Gutters in Ethiopia, Encyclopedia Ethiopica. It's under the D Ha section, page 732. We're going to check out what is said right there. But based on this document, not too sure when this document was, um, yeah, not too sure when this document was uh, written or created, but they say that that's one of the references that points to that the Gutters is no longer universally thought of as previously assumed to be an offshoot of Sabian or South Arabian. And there is some linguistic, though not written, evidence of Semitic languages being spoken in Eritrea, right, and Ethiopia since approximately 2000 BC. So 2000 BC is about is about 400, uh, no, 600, 600 years before the Exodus, roughly 600 years before the Exodus. I'll point that out because the biblical narrative gives us the other side and this is how we know that the scripture the bible when correctly read and understood right and then we do the proper research on it can be proven to be right history right and on a lot of things that they assume the bible was lying on then they found out but sometimes somebody would take the bible and say it's saying something like the earth is only six thousand years old or something like that and they say these kind of foolishnesses Right, like it was created 6,000 years ago when the Bible does not even say that. Right, you know, if we look at the difference between verse 1 and verse 2, right, there's space there, and then time is only accounted for, right, in modern times by the rotation and the orbits of the heavenly bodies, right, the sun and the moon and the stars. But then the, that wasn't created according to the Bible only on the what? Or brought forward on like the fourth day. So that means that if we stop there with the third, fourth day, that means the days before that cannot be accounted like that so how can we say it's 6,000 that was some European scholars that you know not scholars so much but Bible people like religious Christian white 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 Christian people who basically I don't know if they were wasp at that time or not or still under the Catholic church who basically came with those that was Ulster I think the name was Ulster Usher Ulster something like that who basically came with that particular view Right? Then people say, oh, the Bible says this. No. Certain people have said the Bible say this. Right? And other biblical scholars and ones who understand it better say, no, that is not true. In fact, the scripture even backs up, you know, the earth being millions of years old. Right? But the present earth age, according to the Ethiopic, right, this present earth age, because the earth goes through these cycles. Right? It's known in nature. You know, there's, there are cycles that, that earth and land and things go through. But that's a whole other point right there. Let's go through this paragraph right here. However, since the Gutter's script later replaced epigraphic South Arabian, so they make it this epigraphic, okay, South Arabian in the kingdom of Aksum, right? And this guy, Crumb TV, who had an Akhala Selassie kind of thing, he talks about, he talks about Aksum is in Eritrea. Aksum is not really Eritrea. Aksum is in the Tigra region, right below Eritrea, 
right? You just got to know what you got to know, right? And be right and accurate. And the problem is that a lot of ones hear and they hear what they pretend they want to hear, right? And it's going to do you and your children and your posterity a lot of damage, right? Unless you correct these errors quick, fast, right? That's why we're checking them on the fallacy of the fourth of, 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 of the fallacy of fourth this century Ethiopic, right? Fourth or the fourth century Ethiopic fallacy. You know why it is a lie, right? And it's dangerous to real serious true studies. Epigraphic South Arabian letters were used for a few inscriptions in the eighth century BCE. So they're saying like in the 700s, like 700 BCE, 700 counting down to the so-called AD. Though not any South Arabian language since Dim D Damot, right? Not any South Arabian language. See, when you study linguistics, you can see how kind of um, fraudulent people are being. Like people will say sometimes that there is no um, like a, a Egyptian words in the Bible, but there are. There are a lot of, and you can tell that if you really knew biblical Hebrew. Right? And if they really understood what they're saying, they're trying to find any nuance of differences to kind of, it's called divide and conquer. Right? Though not any South Arabian language since Damot, right? or Dimit, they would say, but Damot. Early inscriptions in Gu'uz and Gu'uz script have been dated. That's what they say. Early inscriptions in Gu'uz script have been dated. Dated by who? Dated by who? Come on, dated by who? See, if we just go to the basic principles of real black, you could say, scholarship, right, and black history and black knowledge and black consciousness, we have to recognize that they have done certain things to the history that we knew to be true because our parents and our grandparents told us. It wasn't written down anywhere. And then when we took the principles from that, we saw that the bias, the racism, the white privilege, whatever it was, was still going on. So we recognized that what they were saying was true. We didn't say, well, you didn't write it down, so it didn't happen. Or the white man was even trying to say that, oh, these things wasn't going on, right? And we had to go through like all sort of leaps and bounds to just prove. See, we have to get out of that idea of we have to prove it to somebody else or we got to use the so-called European standards, right? Well, not even the standards, because some of the standards are things that we used to do. Like they'd say black people are right brain and white people are left brain. I say that, that, that's a fallacy too, right? We have to start to use our, our so-called, our full brain, right? So this is not a point to even get emotional off of, although ones will say, oh, you're emotional. No, ones are seeking to bring the other half of the story that hasn't been told. And we hope that that Ethiopian, um, Eritrean, Eritrean brother, you know, and also others, you know, start to build with us. Come, let us build. We are really more in that sense brothers because when we talk about Ethiopian Hebrew and the whole Ethiopian connection, we're talking about here about the fallacy of fourth century, right? This is defending what you, Ante, you know, and in a, you know, I and I, what we know to be true. But here, 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 it says early inscriptions right, and good script have been dated, they say, to as early as the 5th century B.C. Wait, hold on for a moment. The 5th century what? B.C. The 5th century. Now, what they're saying is that so some of the script they find, and why don't you find more manuscripts, say, in the region of the Horn of Africa than you find in ancient Egypt? Because Egypt or Kemet is a dry-ass country. It's, it's a very dry, it's a dry place. And it's known, and ask archaeologists and researchers this, you know, those who dig up stuff. And so in places that are dry, like deserts, sometimes there's the ability for things to be amazingly preserved in a desert or a dry place. Even ancient peoples with the Qumran and other, you know, documentation and Nag Hammadi, they put things way out there. You know, they put them things way out there, like in desert places, because they even knew in their time. When you're living in a tropical region like the equator, like Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa, manuscripts have to be rewritten. And the brother made a very good point about the good is language in the Bible being one and how it had to be rewritten. But they didn't want to hear that. Right? It had to be written. So what happens is that they may find a manuscript that been managed to be preserved right, from, say, 1400 
AD and they try to say, well, this whole thing was just created and made up in 1400 AD when that manuscript right there might be the 10th, 20th, right, 30th, you know, maybe 100th generation later of a particular document. This is known, especially where you're in a region of the world where some things, parchment, only survive for so long. That's why they build the monasteries, you know, you know, above the horizon level in certain dry places in order to preserve manuscripts for a lot longer. And historically, we know that a lot of, you know, the, the, the Beta Israel, black Jews, you know, Israelite stuff was destroyed by many different ones, sometimes outsiders, sometimes insiders, you know, that other things were destroyed by a lot of outside invasions, you know, destroyed libraries, so forth and so on. So it is, it is, it is, it is um, disingenuous, right, to dismiss those factors. What you have to say is that there's more here than is being revealed to us, and we shouldn't jump off the so-called proverbial bridge, as it were, Right, the bridge that doesn't even have water there, but have concrete to assume as though a language just, 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 just popped up. The language, of course, became more popular as a what do you call like a lingua franca, like as a means to communicate in a kingdom or a government. I mean, any see a lot of black men. I'm sad to say, don't understand that. Right, you got to have one language. You got to have a language of government. You got to have a language of war. Right? You, there has to be certain language. Language is so very, very important. Right? And many of these ones, Dagger Squad, the rest of them speaking out against the Ethiopic and the Gutters. You don't have standing. You don't have standing. You, 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 don't, even know, you don't even know what you're talking about. You, you are basically deep ending. Then, you, then they'll turn around and talk about the white man out of two sides of their mouth. You know what I mean? And Garfield, he's just on a hustle, man. He, this is a new thing he's hustling. But hey, we might even contribute a little bit because if you went through enough to even put together a book, great. Check it out. But as far as what you're talking about here, if the Ethiopic and the good is, you should let the brother speak, right? Instead of trying to hop on it because you think you know because you're, you're, you're a Wikipedia, uh, a Google scholar, right? And even some things you can learn from there. But if you don't go deeper than that, get into the real linguistics, and at least give a right of place to the people that can trace their lineage to the particular region, understanding what we have gone through as a people being displaced and not knowing really who we are. Come on, get off it, right? They depend on DNA. So why don't you start a DNA lab or something like that, right? See, science can be very good, but if you're not in control of the science, if, you're not man if you can't fact check, if they say, well, this this DNA says this, and we can't check this out ourselves, right? But that's a whole other point. I know they like the DNA point, but it says, but you don't even have the wherewithal to understand the DNA of linguistics. You don't got no DNA linguistics. And in a sort of proto is written in ESA since the ninth century BC. So that so here they're going into all this kind of like a proto, like there was a good is written before the good is. It's like when we say there was Paleo Hebrew. And another point is that Hebrew, right? Hebrew, right, is not a they were not Canaanites. I'm I'm surprised at y'all even saying that. Y'all regurgitating a later day another Gentile European philosophy, and it's deep when you recognize what's behind it, right? Hebrew, like Amharic, is Afro-Semitic. What does that mean? It's like you have languages that have one. It's like modern Hebrew, for example. Modern Hebrew, for example, has many root biblical. Hebrew verbs, but they insert a lot of um, other words right into it that are like modern terms. And the order of modern Hebrew is more the English order and not the ancient, we say, Semitic order. Like words have a particular word order, where, how you put the verb, adverb, so forth and so on. So the order of modern Hebrew is basically an English or Western order. The primary verbs are biblical Hebrew and the primary pronouns and verbs are biblical Hebrew but they insert other words and ideas it's like when you hear a, 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 a Hispanic person speaking Spanish 
and then sometimes they'll throw in other ideas, other words there to further make the point for right now, 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 right? So you don't understand those things about the linguistics and language and are not really authorized. And I hope your audience recognizes that and they tell you to stay in your lane, right? Good is literature properly, they say, now here's the last part, begins, properly begins according to who? Properly begins, let's go on, properly begins with Christianization of Ethiopia. And since, as you mentioned already, a lot of these um, pro-blacks, a lot of them, not all, not all, but many of them are anti-Christ, even anti-black Christ, right, and anti-Bible, because they've got no standing in it. They really should be anti-Kemetic because they don't got no standing in that. They can't read Metuneta either. They're just depending on a lot of Gentile or white scholars, and then at the next side of the mouth, they want to go against a so-called white man, Right? And then use the white man's research against their fellow black man, right? who just happens to have a different, you could say, spiritual, theological, um, national identity. If we say we're Hebrews or Israelites or we affirm the truth of the Bible. But the Christianization, they say, was Azana. They said Azana was the ruler of the kingdom of Aksum. Right? Aksum, in, in the language, is, there's no X. It's the K-S sound that makes the X. In the land. See, you would know that if you could read it, but now you know it, now you can act like you always knew it. But Azana was the ruler of the kingdom of Aksum, an ancient kingdom located in what is now Eritrea and the Tigray region of northern Ethiopia. He himself employed the style King of Saba. Remember, we were talking about Saba, the Sabians? King of who? Of Saba and Salhain, Himyar, and Du Ra. Rydon, do right on. I might not be pronouncing that, you know, exact, but do right on. Just reading this right here. Now, remember the quote from Joel chapter 3, verse 6, 7, but main verse, verse 8, where it says that the, those who sold the, the children of the Yehuda of Judah and the children of the Jerusalem, right? Because the so called slave trade or the enslavement trade of the black peoples who identified as Hebrews, Israelites, and Jews, right, also occurred in East Africa. Let's put that here. It didn't occur to the extent it did, right, because in East Africa, there was more who held to a certain firmness of their, of their culture and their theology that did not have a problem in defending themselves against the so-called white man. We know this historically with Ethiopia, Eritrea, and those peoples over there. In other words, for a period of time, they really did live right, like Israelites and in the Israelite way of doing it and like real Israelites who believe in the Messiah for a good period of time. We can back that up if ones want to go there. Tradition states that Azana succeeded his father, El Amida, by right, Usanus as king. So they say that it was Christianization. So here's where it could now in the Western Gentile world, because white Christians, white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant Christians, have, have uh, how can we say what they have done? They have made a, a mockery historically by and large not all not all of christianity in other words because white people and people in the western world are against how white christians white male you know the so-called white patriarchal how white patriarchal christians have run you know the world system in the name of god in the name of christ in the name of jesus in the name of the bible in the name of all this and that right and there is a justifiable pushback on white Anglo-Saxon Protestant white Christianity, some of these black scholars, wannabe scholars and master teachers and the rest of them out there in the conscious community, they're making proverbial fools of themselves because they're trying to say that everything so-called emanates from the white man. But then they'll say out the next side of their mouth, the white man came and took things from them in Egypt and, and elsewhere Right, science and knowledge and all of this, and now started to dominate and use it bad and rule the world and abuse people and everything. But then when we say, well, this happened to us as black Jews and as black Christians too, right? Then they want to say the Bible don't really exist and we don't want to deal with the Bible. You can't use the Bible in history. You can't talk about religion and history. You're a fool if you can't speak about religion and history. 
because the reality is that a lot of the white patriarchy, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant patriarchy did what they did historically because of their twisted anti-Christ, anti-black Christ view right, of the scripture. So when we look at the historical thing, why did they do this to blacks? Why didn't they consider black people to be human beings? Oh, because they twisted up the Bible and talk about the curse of Ham when the Bible never mentions Ham as being cursed by Canaan, right? Be that as it may, Gutter's literature, they say, properly begins the Christianization of Ethiopia and the civilization of Ak. It's Ak Sun in the linguistic, in the Gutter's language, Ak Sun in the fourth century, during the reign of Azana of Ak Sun. So even here on the Ethiopic page, or the Gutter's page, right, the G E, if you say Gies, G E uh, apostrophe, um, e Z, right? There's a section called Origin. We just read the first paragraph of Origin. So even in this first paragraph, they don't explicitly say this, but there's a fallacy that goes out there, especially in the so-called black conscious community among certain ones and ones when we introduce Gutters or Ethiopic into it. They'll say, oh, it's just from the fourth century and there's no scripture. Can you show me a manuscript of scripture that's older than the fourth century? We can show you writing, right? See, we have writing on buildings and writing in stone. See, they're, they're, they're still writing in stone up water, upwind, up the Nile in the highlands, right? That points to this evidence, and the evidence is there from what we know being within this community too, right? As an Ethiopian Hebrew, black Jew of the line of the tribe of Judah, we're in that in the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated as well, right? The one that is the membership of the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated, right? The real membership worldwide. Anyway, we're into this sort of research and we've seen a lot of it, right? Some of it is in some of the European journals and a few American journals, but generally speaking, you're not gonna be able to find it by just Googling it out there or see it on the Wikipedia page unless somebody comes along and then checks this and then have it maybe as another footnote and then they'll say, well, some say such and such and such, right? But anyway, the fallacy is proven even here on the Wikipedia page. So it goes back to what I was saying is that it's not that these ones are not reading. They're not comprehending what they're reading. They're reading the part where it says that Gutter's literature properly begins with the Christianization of Ethiopia and the civilization of Axum in the fourth century. Even this idea of the Christianization of Ethiopia, because we know about the Isation, whether Americanization or the thisization, right? The niggerization of Israelites here in America. The niggerization. We need to coin that right there. Right? Check, check. The niggerization. Right? Yadin coins, the niggerization. Maybe someone else has it, but we're going to push this. In the same sense, that Isation thing seems like a bad thing. Right? So they're. When ones and the ones like them look at it, they're thinking about, okay, the white Gentile, the European Christian, blah, 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 right? And saying, oh, wow, right? This is what Azana did and happened in Ethiopia. When the actual recorded um, indigenous testimony, you know what I mean? The indigenous testimony. Think about it. They would not do this to other groups of people. But, but, and it's not even they i.e. the European so-called white people that are doing this, but it's the, some of these pseudo-black scholars out there like the Dagger Squad and the rest of them, right, that are doing this, right? But even the article right here basically is stating, right, that Gutter's literature started to increase, right, after Christianity became, or Christian, not Christianity, but after the faith of Christ, right, became the official, we could say, the religion. But before that, they don't go to the fact that before that, there's strong populations, right, of Beta Israel, right, of Israelites. Some say the tribe of Don. Others have other speculation which tribe the Beta Israel is of. But there's, but we also know the Judah, tribe of Judah is there, right? Other tribes were there, right, who lived under the general you know, the general um, name of Ethiopia, Ethiopian, or even Eritrean. But they didn't have these, a lot of these terminology like, like Eritrean today, so as it is today and everything. But they lived in those regions. So prior to Christian or the New Testament, 
there was already the Old Testament. See, that's the, that's the other half of the story. They don't want to fact check, right? And a lot of those documents, you say, where are those documents? Well, um, many of the, the, those of the state of Israel, right? The, the agents for the state of Israel in moving others of our people to the state of Israel took a lot of those manuscripts from many of those communities and have put them up in the secret archives of Hebrew University, right, to this very day. But before they did that, there's other evidence that proves that, and historically that, before Ethiopia was Christian, so to speak, quote, unquote. Right? Because there's a bias and there's a bad view based on how the white man dealt with us calling himself Christian. So we hear about Ethiopians doing this over there. We think it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Right? But before that, there was the influence of the Yehudit. There was Yodit. Yodit, Yehudit, right? Yehudit, right? And not just the Ethiopians testifying to themselves, but there's other peoples that have histories as well. So we're dismissing our own black perspective and using certain white scholarship, even out of order against our fellow black people, right? When our people are saying, well, this is what we've learned from looking at the research. I mean, things we learned from looking at the manuscripts themselves. Right? But here, 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 in this article, it goes back to 5th century and even the 9th century, where they have what they call proto, right? uh, you know, like the proto-Semitic or proto, like the first form of it. Because if you look at scripts, it's like when we look at scripts, scripts sometimes appear differently. Let's see, like you have, like you see, uh, this is like a different script, right? right? And now this is some of what they kind of consider the proto. Right, but this is actually, if you look at this right here, this is both Sabian, right, and it is Proto Ethiopic. Well, I'm showing ones and ones right here, right now on the screen, is both Sabian and Proto Ethiopic, right? And looking at many of the letters, many of the letters directly are in the same shape, sigil pattern as they would appear, right, for thousands of years, even, even more than 2,000 years later. Right, and then you have to. This is also another example right here. This is an example right here where you can see the one on the right hand is the Ethiopic, the Gutas, and the one on the left hand where the arrow is pointing from to the Ethiopic, right, is that Sabian, right, is like the earliest Sabian slash proto Semitic. Now, we already show you the biblical verse from Joel. Right? So Joel points to the proximity and the closeness of these peoples and that these peoples right, would be right, working together. These people would be working together. I haven't checked out this brother's thing right here, but saw this when we was going through a few things. Let's go right back here. Right? This brother's thing right here. Metzhete, Metzhete Aemro. Metzhete Aemro. Metzhete, the language of of wisdom, of knowledge, right? Of wisdom, of knowledge. Yeuket mestawat, right? Yeuket of knowledge. Yeah, mestawat, right? Yes, yeah. so here, 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 here. The fallacy. G is, to sum it up, is much older, much more archaic, and because of its preservation of old forms, forms that explain the biblical Hebrew words. There are biblical Hebrew words, right? Archaic words, even in some of the translation, you know, some of the software, interlinear Bible software, you look up some words and sometimes they'll say, this is really an archaic word. You hear, you'll see where they always talk about primitive, right? Uh, can we bring that up? Can we bring that up right here? Let's bring it up just as one example, a closing example right here, right? Let's take the word Sabian, right, right, right? Shabai, 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 right? In the Hebrew, Shabai, right? Now here, you see that definition says drunkard or he who is coming. See, because there's actually two Semitic languages and two dialects. In one dialect, it can mean drunken, but in another dialect, it means he who is coming. <laughs> right, he who is coming right here. Now, notice this right here. If we go to the root right here, right here, we have Sheba. Sheba. Now, Sheba here. Now, notice it here. Sheba is seven or oath 
because also within the language and linguistics, Shaba, Shaba can mean seven or oath. And no, not like Crumb TV said, you know, he's no scholar at all, but I guess a, a pseudo scholar, he said that, oh, uh, we say Sheba is British English and Saba. No, Saba is another word. In Hebrew, we have Sheba and Saba. So uh, that is incorrect right there. Right? So you can see right here, this is from the biblical reference. Notice what he said, a foreign, a foreign origin. Of, of what foreign origin? Now we have a linguistic, a language that still maintains all the primary roots. And what language is that? That language is Ge'ez. Here it says a foreign, it says Sheba, the name of three early progenitors of tribes and of an Ethiopian district, an area, a, a certain area. Sheba and the Sabians. Sheba and the Sabians. Let's see if we can get another word right here and just um, Yehuda. Let's go to Yehuda. We're just going to show you what comes up sometimes when you're looking. Boom, right there. Where well, you see the origin? It says origin, a primitive root. A primitive root. See, if you're not linguistic, if you're not into linguistic, academic, how to use words and terminology to convey to their peers, right, um, certain ideas while going into it in detail, Right, primitive, gutters, right, is that primitive, is the reference point. I say it is, but right now we'll say it's the reference point to the primitive root. And it's the reference point that Strong's used, right, in the Strong's Concordance that then refers to Gesenius, his lexicon, and over and over in certain archaic words and terminology that may not appear many times in the Bible, they always zoom in on the Ethiopic, on the Gutters. And so the Gutters itself means first, has that idea of first in its like root meanings, right? A primitive root, right? They didn't say a primitive root and they're going to go into what the primitive root is. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't even, they said primitive root. They're, they're mute, right? They're mute on the primitive root. I display to you that the primitive root, right? The primitive root is gutters. That gutters is that primitive root. And we can back that up by the strong concordance and the Jesenius lexicon, even the blue letter Bible, the old, the classic version. You look up certain words. And if you look up even like head, it goes even links with like reis, reis, reis. Right, Rosh, Rosh, the Hebrew Ritis, and then later on Ras. Right, we have got Ras, yes, I, Ras the far eye. So here, 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 the fallacy, the fallacy. Don't believe the fallacy of fourth century Ethiopic. The idea that Ethiopic only goes to the fourth century is not older than the fourth century and only became relative because it was a part of the Christianization. Because we know that many of the tribes that still remain to be non Christian in the same region, like the Yehudi, like the Jews or the Israelite tribes, like Judith, Yodit, and others, right, who lived within the region of Ethiopia, what's called Ethiopia, Eritrea today as well as Meroe and Napata, they lived in those regions, of which the Ethiopian, the one called the Ethiopian eunuch, was one of the members of that community. So even right there, we have evidence, and he was going to Jerusalem to worship, right? Not to do business in that sense, but to worship. So who go to, because he, so you see the link between the Ethiopian saving, the Shebans, the Judah, Judah, children of Judah, children of Jerusalem, all within that area right there. And also within their biblical translation as a primitive root point of reference, they use the as the Ethiopic. That there itself proves that a language that can't just pop up overnight, yet it contains the root references that other languages that are historically testified to be before it and have manuscripts like the Hebrew before it, in order to understand it, Ethiopic is very, very important. Right? And this is another reason why even certain of the European Jews, Halevi, others, right, even before their movement, the European Jewish movement really rose up and really were able to you know, do the whole modern Hebrew thing, many of their top scholars were in Ethiopia. All right. So we yield right here, 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 here. So check out the description right here. Also link us at lojs.org, lojs.org. We got the podcast. 
the podcast um 10 p.m to 1 a.m tuesday to saturday 10 30 on mondays the call in number 515-602-9761 that's 515-602-9761 if you get this one cents a minute it's not us it's because of t-mobile slash metro pc sometimes they charge as one a one cent surcharge for some of these chat lines call services but you can always check us out on the podcast app and always check out the replay listen on demand the streaming on demand but check all the links out at lojs.org we have the site up still under construction you know give us any you know, any, you know, any, any, any word, feed forward, you know, things we can do a little bit better or things that we are doing good or some other areas as well. Hit the contact. So like, share, subscribe and repost. Yes, I, Ross Tafari. This is Ross Yadin, Ross Yadonis Tafari, LOJ Society.